As football fans waited for the new Premier League season in August, England sweltered in the hottest summer on record. Fevered anticipation fueled dreams of glory and despair. The season promised skill, passion, failure, commitment, blood, sweat and tears. For some, it would prove unbeatable. August the 16th couldn't come quickly enough. From the east he came, one man who would change the landscape of English football overnight. The purchase of Chelsea Football Club by Russian billionaire Roman Abramovich in July was the most significant event in world football. £100 million of debts were cleared with a flourish of the checkbook. The world's best footballers headed to West London, pulled by the lure of the ruble. Chelsea were now a force to be reckoned with. Manchester United had lifted their eighth Premier League title in May 2003, cementing their place at the top of the tree. But the seismic events at Stamford Bridge had rippled north. They brought a lot of quality in. With Chelsea signing all these players, spending all the money, Arsenal themselves have, have got much the same squads. Uh, but, you know, the, the Premier League is not an easy league to win. Uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult. You can go anywhere in this league and lose. And um, therefore, we look upon hopefully our experience helping us when it comes to the crucial part of the season, right about uh, March and April and May. At Arsenal, German goalkeeper Jens Lehmann was the only major arrival, and he cost just one and a half million pounds. But Wenger knew he had plenty of talent to improve on last season's second place. Every day, my job is to come in here and try to do the maximum with what I have available. And, uh, Ranieri does certainly the same, like uh, by spending 110 million. They will certainly uh, fight for it even more, so it make it tougher for us and for Man United. Unlimited resources brings pressure, and Chelsea manager Claudio Ranieri was now responsible for integrating 10 new signings. Manchester United and Arsenal are ahead of us. They've been working together for many years. Even if you add one or two players, the nucleus is still there. I have to introduce nine, ten, eleven players. Well, that's the difference. I have great players, but we're not a team, so we have to work hard in that direction. Chelsea kicked off a new era against a Liverpool side desperate to make the running with the big three. Evolution at Chelsea. Arsenal, meanwhile, welcomed Everton to Highbury. Right for Henry. Good effort, good save, but it's going to go in, is it? No saved. Perez. The champions began their defence at home to Bolton, parading new boy Cristiano Ronaldo. Ronaldo. Skulls. Van Nistelrooy. Giggs. 2 0 Manchester United. And Giggs gets his second. Three wins for the big three, and the three horse race everyone was predicting had begun. Chelsea weren't the only club introducing fresh talent to the Premiership. Middlesbrough pulled off a coup de grace by luring Geishka Mendieta to Teesside. And a host of players, old and new, came to spice up life in English football. And after an absence of only one season, Leicester City made a welcome return to the Premier League with nine new players costing a grand total of nothing. My first full season as a manager in the Premier League, and that's exciting in itself. Let's try and prove a few people wrong because everybody's written us off before we've kicked a ball. Let's go out there and enjoy ourselves. Now one last one, this will be the last one, all this way. Right. It was carnival time in the East Midlands as Leicester kicked off at the Smart Walker Stadium against Southampton. 2-0 up after only 10 minutes of the season, the Foxes ended up sharing the points and their home form was to prove problematic for the whole campaign.
Wolverhampton Wanderers welcomed Premiership football to Molyneux for the first time. The old gold shirts of Wolves had been absent from the top flight for 19 years and manager Dave Jones was anticipating problems. It's going to be tough and that's the way we're going to uh, approach every game. That's the way we approached every game in the first division. Nobody's going to give us anything. If we're going to get something, we have to go out and earn it. And I can't see it being any different for the next uh, 12 months of our campaign. Day one of that campaign and Wolves were dealt a severe lesson in the harsh realities of life in the Premier League. Blackburn Rovers knocking five past Matt Murray in the Wolves goal. It was to be a long, hard season in the black country. Premier League football was also taking a bow at Fratton Park as Portsmouth returned to the top flight after a 15-year absence. Promoted as champions, the passion of Portsmouth's fans lit up the Premier League landscape and one in particular stood out above the rest, the legend that is John Portsmouth Football Club Westwood. I love the club, I mean, I think about it every week. Well, I wake up in the mornings and I'm always thinking about Pompey, I'm always buying the newspapers to read about Pompey. And it's just another way to show my devotion to the club. And uh, it was the best thing I ever did. Everyone else thinks I'm crackers, but I thought it was great. Of all the promoted clubs, Portsmouth, under the guidance of Harry Redknapp and Jim Smith, looked best equipped for the Premiership. Their blistering start to the season confirmed it. They knocked four past Bolton, 37-year-old Teddy Sheringham scoring the first Premier League hat-trick of the season. After three games, Portsmouth were top of the Premiership. We've had a great start, but they've got to accept that there are going to be bad days and there's going to be good days and we've got to enjoy the good days and we've got to all stick together through the bad days and um, that's how it's going to be. It's a tough, tough division, but we've made a smashing start. Glenn Hoddle's return to Tottenham Hotspur as manager in 2001 was billed as the return of the Messiah. But two years on, and the headlines had a distinctly funereal tone. With only four points from their opening six games, Spurs were 17th in the table. Through a poetic circularity, Hoddle's previous club, Southampton, came to North London to inflict the defeat that would condemn him. The legend had returned to the lane but was about to suffer an ignominious fall from grace. I'm feeling the hurt more than the pressure. The pressure, I've been there and I've expect, you know, I had to deal with that with the England job. I'm hurt inside. You know, that's where the pressure comes, if you like. It's very hurtful to see that we're not getting the results that we can achieve, and I know what they can achieve in there. Hoddle was sacked the very next day. Dominating the news in the early part of the season was Manchester United defender Rio Ferdinand. Having missed a mandatory drug test, his case went to the very top, with FIFA president Sepp Blatter calling for the FA to impose a lengthy ban. Ferdinand claimed he forgot about the test at the club's Carrington training ground on the 23rd of September. Sir Alex Ferguson stuck firmly behind the club's record signing and continued to include him in the team selections. Ferdinand's domestic and international future was to be decided at an FA hearing in December. Chief Executive Peter Kenyon resigned his post at Manchester United in September. He was to become Chelsea's latest signing, but would not be allowed to join the Blues until February. When Arsenal travelled to Old Trafford at the end of September for the first meeting between the two Premier League giants, no one could have predicted what would follow. As nil-nil draws go, it was highly volatile. Patrick Vieira was sent off for a lunge at Ruud van Nistelrooy. Arsenal accused him of play-acting, and when the Dutchman missed a late penalty kick, the Arsenal players decided to take the law into their own hands. Passions were at boiling point. 
I think Van Nistelrooy doesn't help. He's a great player, but uh, his attitude is always uh, looking for provoke, provocation and diving. And uh, he looks a nice boy, but uh, I think on the pitches and not always a fair behaviour. But the press lambasted Arsenal and were critical of Wenger's apparent lack of contrition. Six Arsenal players were banned for a total of nine matches and the club were fined £175,000. We overreacted, but uh, I think the media's overreacted as well. We didn't uh, behave like we should have done and like we want to behave and of course we uh, apologised for that and, uh, and uh, think we we want to rectify that and it will never happen again. The impact of the bans could have wrecked Arsenal's season, but the Gunners improved their behaviour and never looked back. The Millennium Bridge dominates the River Tyne, but in September it was a bridge over troubled waters. Without a win in their opening six games, Newcastle United were struggling in the relegation zone. Perennial slow starters, an early exit from the Champions League added to their frustration. What has to happen at this club, what this club needs at the moment, is time to go, to go over these bumps. You know, we're hitting choppy waters and we, we need to get over the choppy waters and get into a calmer sea. Newcastle had to wait until October the 4th for their first win of the season. By the end of September, the top of the Barclay Card English Premier League had a familiar look, with the top three separated by a point. Liverpool in eighth had made a disappointing start. Newcastle, Leeds and Tottenham were the surprise names at the bottom of the table. Wolves shared with Newcastle the unenviable record of being the only teams in the division without a win. After six Premier League matches, Steve Bruce's Birmingham City boasted the meanest defence in the league. Goalkeeper Mike Taylor had only had to collect the ball from his net three times, and the Blues were in a kind of dreamland. Fourth place in the table. We're not going to get, try and get carried away with it. We've got to keep everybody's feet on the ground. It's been a great start, but we know that like this week, for instance, we're going to, to Manchester. We've got Chelsea around the corner, Villa after that, so there's two or three huge big games coming up. Having captained United for Sir Alex Ferguson, Steve Bruce was to receive a harsh lesson from his old boss at Old Trafford. Forland for Manchester United. Look at the space! Giggs! Birmingham's defence tarted for Ryan Giggs. Three conceded in one match, but Birmingham City were to have another good season in the top flight. Those who made their way to Molyneux on the 25th of October could not have anticipated what they were about to witness. At half-time, Leicester were cruising 3-0 up against Wolves. For 45 minutes, you're looking at how you can change it, how you can stop goals going in. What was going through your mind is how, how can you go out the second half and you know improve and try and get back into it. But as the game unfolded, it went from just getting back into the game to getting a point from the game to actually knowing and believing that you were then going to go on and win it because we were in full flow and Leicester were on the back foot. Confidence just soared right through the team and I've always maintained that goals do change the attitude uh, of players within a game. In East and West London, two Premier League teams were striking a blow for the less glamorous clubs. Charlton and Fulham were giving the big guns a run for their money. By November, they sat next to each other in fourth and fifth. I think that uh, clubs like ourselves, you know, we should be congratulated if we can bring in you know, decent results. And um, you know, if we, if we play as well as we can, we think we can stay in the top ten. The last three years in the Premiership, I think it's been ninth, 14th and 12th. And, the last two seasons we've been in really good positions to finish in the top ten. Rookie manager Chris Coleman had been the bookies' favourite for the sack at the start of the season, but Fulham were thriving under his guidance. A lot of clubs can look up to Charlton because, you know, the way they run, uh, the financial stability of the club, uh, year in, year out, they're in the Premiership, so, you know, they are a shining light. With eight goals in 13 games, Luis Aha was beginning to attract attention from bigger clubs, but he seemed to be enjoying a stable life in West London. 
I'm completely focused on Fulham. There are always rumours. There are always journalists who'll drum up stuff simply for the sake of it. We don't take any notice. We're playing well. So that's going to attract gossip. A 3-1 victory at Old Trafford was the highlight of the season for the Fulham fans. Nobody expecting us to beat United 3-1. And in the fashion, you know, in the manner which we beat them as well, we beat them convincingly. We were by far the better team on the day. And not many teams can say that when they go to Old Trafford. The beat of the Blackburn Rovers drummers echoes around the Lancashire hills that surround Ewood Park. Sixth last season, Rovers were second from bottom in early November and were finding it difficult to get into the rhythm of the new campaign. I would love to think we could finish sixth again. I don't think we will. We were sitting in the wrong half of the table as far as we're concerned. Last year we had a very good year. Um, we get nothing for last year. It's all about what you do tomorrow. Not only in this business, as in life. Rovers were learning to cope without Damien Duff and David Dunn, both sold in the summer. The opening day drubbing of Wolves was a fading memory and they now started to leak goals as an element of doubt crept in. We've been punched on the nose too many times already this year. We've shot ourselves in the foot too many times this year. But they've shown a resilience which, which suggests to me that we'll be fine at the end of the day. The beat went on, but Rovers were to struggle all season amid rumours of dressing room unrest. In October, Sir Alex Ferguson became involved in a row over the ownership of the Wonder Horse Rock of Gibraltar with John Magna, a main shareholder at Old Trafford. Magna added more fuel to the fire by suggesting Sir Alex should only be offered a year-long rolling contract at United instead of the expected four-year deal. Liverpool's influential captain Steven Gerrard pledged his future to the Merseyside club for another three years in November, keeping him at Anfield until 2007. In October, out-of-favour goalkeeper Fabien Barthez left Old Trafford to join French club Marseille on a loan deal. Barthez had won the European Cup in a previous spell at the club. The deal was to become permanent. By November, Leeds United were struggling on and off the field. Crippled by debt, the club were facing administration. They were bottom of the league, and manager Peter Reid was sacked after a 6-1 thrashing at Portsmouth. Elland Road legend Eddie Gray was handed the poison chalice and was under no illusion that the future looked bleak. I think the supporters realise that the club are in trouble. You know, um, they looked at the situation, the players that have left the club, you know, the, the financial uh, troubles of the club are well documented. Two years ago in May, I was sat in Valencia watching us in the semi-final of the, the Champions League and I can't believe we're in the position we're in. Yeah, it, it's done a complete about-face with, with you know, a real sense of alarm about it. The fans will always turn up. Leeds United, if we get relegated, we'll still be here next season. Well, maybe. Around £100 million in debt, Gray was attempting to rescue Leeds' season while the club fought for its very life. But the players were lacking belief after only two wins all season. Obviously the fans are thinking what's going on, you know. One season we're at the top of the league and pushing for Champions League and we're in the semi-final of the European Cup and, you know, now we're at the bottom, plump bottom of the league and, you know, we're struggling a little bit. The incredible loyalty of the Leeds fans is well known and it would be tested to breaking point throughout an emotional season. By the last day of November, the big three had all played each other and were out on their own. And who takes, scores! Crespo shot, 1-1. One, one. What a glorious shot it was. Away. Can he find Henry here? Oh, he can! It's a goal! What a mess up! Extraordinary! Here's Ronaldo. Good effort! Is that a penalty kick? It is! He's done it! He's Frank Lampard.
Chelsea were sitting pretty at the top of the table and with a form team having won their previous five matches. Fulham and Charlton were enjoying life in fourth and fifth respectively. With three wins in their previous four Barclay Card English Premier League matches, Leicester City were beginning to climb the table. Everton had slipped worryingly into the drop zone. This programme is sponsored by Bet365. By December, Liverpool were 14 points off the pace and had already conceded that the title was beyond them for another year. Brian Giggs, and it's in again. Liverpool nil, Manchester United two. Following that defeat by Manchester United, Gerard Houllier found himself under intense scrutiny from the fans and media alike. The championship this season is out of reach because uh, there are three teams rushing, probably racing up front and maybe playing in a league of their own at the moment. But it wasn't just the big three who were taking points from Liverpool. Once a fortress, Anfield was becoming a gift shop. Before Christmas, the Reds had won only four times at home. Houllier was quick to list his roster of injured players in defence of the slump. At the moment, uh, we're just suffering because we're missing key players. I mean, we've got about five or six international players who are sidelined. You can't really hide behind that, and I don't think we should. The fact is, our performances haven't been up to scratch, and you have to, as players, look, you know, look in the mirror and say, you know, can you do more? We win together and we suffer together. And uh, this is a period where, in fact, the great characters and the true colours are shown. And I'm not disappointed by my play, I can tell you. The drift of the top three, Liverpool would have to dig deep to save their season and salvage their pride. Get yourself involved in a bit of that. Southampton's James Beattie and Portsmouth's Matt Taylor were the best of enemies, ahead of the first South Coast derby in 15 years. The Saints were looking to improve on their best ever finish of eighth last season, and victory against their arch rivals would take them to fourth place in the table. There was also the little matter of local pride. With the people in Hampshire, yeah. Um, when the fixture is coming up and, and approaching, that's all they talk about. Well, all our fans do on a Saturday afternoon or Tuesday is shout about, you know, sing about Southampton. I'm sure that all your fans do is sing about us. So. Especially when we're on telly. Yeah. <laughs> so you knew it was there and you, you know the rivalry's there, but I don't think that until you actually put into the what is the arena, you know, the stadium, I don't think you actually know what it is and it just hits you. Come the big match, the Saints swept to victory in emphatic fashion, though Pompey would gain revenge at Fratton Park later in the season. James Beatty dishes it out to Portsmouth. He has got in on the act after all. So the Saints were up to fourth going into Christmas. Despite his success at Southampton, manager Gordon Strachan wouldn't last the season, resigning his post, citing medical and personal reasons. Christmas is always a hectic spell for Premier League clubs, but Bolton took time out to brighten the festive period at a local children's hospital. We do uh, obviously have a very busy schedule over December, but uh, there's always time for something like this for just an hour or two to uh, give up your spare time and just, uh, like I said, come down and cheer these youngsters up. We have a game every, just over every three days now, which is uh, pretty tough going, but uh, you know something that as long as the lads stay fit and as confident as they've been playing recently, hopefully we can have a, a shock or two and upset one or two and pinch a point here and there. Bolton started their Christmas programme level on points with Liverpool. A comfortable win for the Reds moved them within three points of that much coveted fourth place. At the Valley, Charlton were taking full advantage of Chelsea's slow start to a derby they began as favourites. And it's in! What a start! Just over 40 seconds! No two with it. And it's glanced in! And it's Joan Terry! Now Yule for four, 4-1 four to Charlton. They're scoring rather too easily for Chelsea's liking. That defeat saw Arsenal leapfrog Chelsea into second. 
Wolves found themselves six points behind Leeds at the foot of the table. A fortuitous own goal from Alan Smith gave Wolves hope of a much needed victory. Two second half strikes from Stefan Everson wrapped up all three points for the home side. The gap at the foot of the table was narrowing. Arsenal's win at Southampton meant the Gunners went into the new year still unbeaten against all other Premiership sides. And Perez has ghosted into space, and Arsenal are in front! Liverpool overturned their opening day defeat against Chelsea by taking all three points at Stamford Bridge, lifting them to fifth. Manchester United made it three wins out of three over Christmas. And Scholes has slipped it through for Giggs, and he's gone past Yaskinainen, but Nisseroy is waiting. We've had to battle tonight, we've had to show qualities that are important in these types of matches, and we'll get the bonus of others dropping points. So United finished a perfect Christmas at the top of the tree. Charlton's great start showed no sign of slowing. The Addicts were still in fourth. Portsmouth's blistering start of the season had well and truly burnt itself out. They now found themselves in the drop zone. Manchester City were sliding alarmingly as well. A seemingly innocuous challenge in a match between Portsmouth and Manchester City in early January was to spell the end of a glittering career after over a thousand appearances. At 40, David Seaman knew it was the right time to hang up the gloves. City was struggling and Kevin Keegan signed David James as a replacement. Injury to Dave on the Saturday, I believe. Um, it sort of started rumours, but then obviously he announced his retirement and the opportunity was there. But um, I mean, from the Saturday to the uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever the, uh, the first talk was, for me to sign Wednesday was, was very quick. City were in free fall down the table. James made his debut at home to Blackburn and Seaman was there to say his goodbyes. Blackburn equalised five minutes after conceding the opener and the draw was City's 12th game in a row without a win. Keegan was beginning to feel the heat. The one thing we need now is, 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 a, is a result or two here, you know, just to get the confidence going again because that's the thing. There's a nervousness and a lack of confidence about a few of us that is understandable when you think, we, you know, since middle of October we haven't won a game here. Manchester United old boys Paul Ince and Dennis Irwin came up against some familiar faces when the champions travelled to Molyneux. It was also a swan song for Rio Ferdinand, about to begin an eight-month ban for missing his drugs test. It proved an unhappy farewell. Possibilities here for Kenny Miller, slipped by Brown, it's Miller! Wolverhampton Wanderers, the bottom club in the Premiership, lead Manchester United. It was United's fourth defeat of the season. The title was slipping from their grasp and they had to defend their crown for the rest of the campaign without Ferdinand. His forgetfulness would prove to be a costly turning point for Manchester United. The transfer window opened in early January and business was conducted amid some acrimony. Tottenham took Jermaine Defoe to White Hart Lane, but it was Charlton and Fulham who lost their star men. Scott Parker moving to Chelsea and Louis Saha to Old Trafford. There were murmurs of disloyalty. I thought it was a great opportunity who was going to pass just like that, so I wasn't happy and uh, I make them understand that. It is a hard situation. In life sometimes decisions come along and which sometimes you can't refuse and I just felt this was a, an occasion which I just couldn't let slip by. Parker was groomed by Charlton and the manner of the transfer sat uncomfortably with his former manager. The last three weeks has left a, a bad taste in my mouth and uh, you know uh, the way this transfer has been conducted uh, we're not happy with but that's life. Sahar made his debut against Southampton on the last day of January and Sir Alex Ferguson's £12 million outlay was to reap immediate dividends. Sahar's opener helped United to a 3-2 victory.
Arsenal were also spending big. Jose Antonio Reyes became their record signing when he arrived from Seville for an initial payment of £10.5 million. Saturday the 7th of February and Newcastle's Gary Speed makes history as the first player to 400 Premiership games. A 2-1 victory in the Carling Cup final against Bolton in February earned Middlesbrough their first trophy in 128 years. One thing I found before the final, from the fans and speaking to everybody in the club, everybody was so convinced that this was the year, this was the season that they were going to do it. And they had a great belief. Having finished seventh last campaign, life was proving slightly trickier for David Moyes and the blue half of Merseyside this season. I think that sometimes people say the second year is always harder than the first year. Uh, I felt that we had started to put a good, good foundations down. You know, we worked very hard last year, very committed, and uh, I expected nothing less than that this year. Victory against Aston Villa in February gave the Toffees their first win of 2004. Expectations were raised, but this was to be a season of acute disappointment at Goodison. On Saturday the 21st of February 2004, Arsenal travelled to Chelsea while Manchester United hosted Leeds. Both games kicked off at 12.30 and it was a significant day in the race for the title. A good early ball in towards Mutu. Good Jonsson! Oh, what a start for Chelsea! 27 seconds gone on my watch and Chelsea go in front! Bergkamp. Vieira has got into a great position here and he's found it. Patrick Vieira! 1-1! Here's Gary Neville. Scores! Goalkeeper's lost it. What a scramble, and it's a goal! They've done it again! Unbelievable! Domi's cross, Smith! It's an equaliser! Alan Smith gets his first ever goal against Manchester United. Arsenal were still unbeaten in the league and were now nine points clear of United and Chelsea. There are 10, 11 matches, but I think nine points are very, very long. long. On the last day of February, Arsenal had won their previous seven Barclay Card English Premier League matches and had opened a comprehensive gap. Aston Villa were up to seven. Leicester, Leeds and Wolves had only two wins between them from their previous 12 games and were all in the drop zone as a result. Manchester City were now only three points from safety. After a turbulent season, Leeds celebrated some good news in March as a consortium saved the club from liquidation. A fire sale of players was still a possibility, but Leeds were once again united. This club was totally insolvent. This club was facing extinction. It would have gone into administration and the administrator would have had a duty to get the best price possible for the ground. What I'm telling you is that on Friday it moved from insolvency to solvency. The takeover brought a new wave of optimism to Elland Road and the team rode that wave against Manchester City in the first game under the new owners. The 2-1 win lifted Leeds off the bottom of the table and Manchester City were now only five points above their conquerors. With nine games to go, Arsenal were still unbeaten in the league. If they could win or draw against Manchester United at Highbury, they would set a new record for consecutive league games without defeat from the start of a season.
Arsenal. 30 games unbeaten from the start of the season. Remarkable achievement for 30 games. Uh, the fact that uh, we keep Man United at 12 points with eight games to go. I think that they'll uh, go on and win a week now. I'm sure of that. Um, they're playing with great determination. A very strong team, so they should win the week away. The battle for the fourth and final Champions League place looked like being a straight race between Liverpool and Newcastle. The last nine, eight or seven games uh, turned to become a sprint, maybe a sprint for the teams, the, the, the three teams at the top and also a sprint for the fourth place. Andy O'Brien's own goal cost Newcastle at Spurs and opened the door for Liverpool. I see it's been very close, nip and tuck, it's extremely competitive. Uh, as you're talking to me now, we're waiting for Liverpool uh, result against uh, Southampton. But neither side were in the kind of form to make that place their own. Liverpool then travelled to Highbury on Good Friday to face Arsenal. The Gunners had been knocked out of Europe and the FA Cup in a matter of days. Great ball. Terrific goal for Liverpool. A test of character in North London as Arsenal looked to regroup. Stepping one, side stepping two! That is brilliant! That is simply stunning! Genius of work! His name is Thierry Henry! Leeds travelled to Ewood Park knowing a win would take them to 31 points, level with host Blackburn. It's Short who's trying to make up the distance. Cut by by Pennant, a back hill surely, but all cut! Only goal difference now kept Blackburn the right side of the drop zone. In another relegation six-pointer, Wolves travel to Manchester City in search of their first away win of the whole season. Henri Camara's goal with ten minutes to go made it 3-2 to the visitors, but Dave Jones was right not to get carried away. Sean Wright Phillips popped up in stoppage time to earn a share of the spoils. Claudio Ranieri needed three points at Villa Park to keep Chelsea in title contention. Brazil now hits Osberger. It meant Chelsea now trailed Arsenal by seven points. Villa continued their surprise push for a European place. Leicester City took a club break in La Manga in March. The trip proved traumatic. After a night out, nine players were arrested, with three of them appearing in a Spanish court accused of sexual assault. All charges have now been dropped but the media frenzy that surrounded the allegations certainly left its mark on Leicester City's season. March also saw Southampton revealing Paul Sturrock as Gordon Strachan's successor. A 2-0 home win over Liverpool in his first game in charge made him an instant hit with the Saints faithful. In April, Birmingham City and Chelsea agreed to extend the loan deal of 17-goal Mikhail Forsell for another season. At Villa Park, they had a rejuvenated hero as Juan Pablo Anjal became the first Villa player to score 20 goals in a season since Dwight York in 1996. I liked him from the start. He, he was a, a person that, you're new, I want to give it a new go here. I've believed in you. And as, as the time went on, um, I think he made believe me more and more. And I was gaining his confidence and uh, he's been a fantastic lad to deal with. 
Villa were the surprise package of the season and David O'Leary was looking an inspired appointment. The villains were mounting a real challenge to Liverpool and Newcastle for fourth place. I was expecting to be a lot further away. I take great enjoyment out of being so near them with so little games to go. Villa began their game against Middlesbrough at the end of April, only one point behind Liverpool and Newcastle. And Peter Crouch's late winner gave 10-man Villa an improbable win. The European dream was still alive. On the same day, Liverpool travelled to Old Trafford, having taken only one point from their previous three games. Now Gerrard. Two cries of handball, but the referee was well placed. Still Gerrard, tackled by Gary Neville, and it is a penalty. And Murphy, of course, is the man for Liverpool. And scores! The race for fourth was really hotting up. Right until the end of the season, there'll be twists and turns, and uh, the race will be probably right to, to the last game of the season. It'll be a hard battle, and uh, we're in the leading place for that, but don't forget that you know, Newcastle have got some games to play as well. The Geordies gave a northeast welcome to Chelsea on Sunday, April the 25th, the day the title race was finally decided. At St James's, Alan Shearer was in one of those moods. Shearer, just look how well he held off. Desai. Oh, say! Sensational from Alan Shearer! It's a bit. A heck of a weekend for us when Liverpool yesterday won surprisingly and so did Aston Villa. And we beat one of the favourites, so uh, we're back, you know, uh, back on the dance floor. We're still dancing. That result meant Arsenal could win the title at the home of their most bitter rivals, Spurs, just as they did in 1971. This is White Hart Lane. This is the day of destiny for Arsenal Football Club. for his first touch of the ball and he glides past the first man who was Redner. He has Bergkamp ahead of him and tries to play Bergkamp in, then he does, here's the cross, Vieira! Arsenal on the score sheet already! Are Arsenal going to win? Are Tottenham going to claim a point? 2-2 two, two it is! are the new Barclay Card English Premier League champions. So Arsenal champions for the 13th time, though their failure to make an impact in Europe was a disappointment. But domestically, they were now four games away from going through the whole season unbeaten, a feat never achieved in the modern era. It is uh, something fantastic which has never been done and uh, we are so close to it. But uh, it's just now, uh, do we switch off or not? Uh, can we keep the concentration going? That night, Thierry Henry became the first player to win the PFA Players Award two years in a row. The Golden Boot winner with 30 league goals, it's sometimes a pleasure to just sit back and marvel. Me and Sue in the summertime, playing football everywhere. Getting tired of some wine, having parties everywhere. With brilliance and a laid-back approach to the prospect of staying unbeaten. We don't really talk about it in the dressing room. It's true that the press talk about it quite a bit, but for us that's not the case. We try to play the matches as they come, and that naturally means to not try and lose them. But that wasn't the objective at the start of the season.
Manchester City, Leicester and Wolves all kicked off at 3 o'clock on Saturday the 1st of May. It would prove to be a pivotal date in the battle for survival. Manchester City's plight was perilous. They had to beat Manchester Stadium! News of one chop's goal was filtering through to the valley and Leicester were condemned by another Paolo 17 minutes later. De Canio slotting a penalty that sent Leicester straight back from whence they came. Wolves went out with a bang as they came from behind to beat Everton. But without an away win all season, it was obvious where their problems lay. Saturday's results meant that Leeds had to win at Bolton on Sunday to stand any chance of survival. They made the perfect start with Mark Viduka putting them ahead after 27 minutes. But just six minutes later, and Hero turned villain as Viduka was dismissed for violent conduct. Down to ten men, Leeds crumbled. Pedersen now with a cross. Oh, it's an own goal! From Ian Hart! It is the end of the Premier League road for Leeds United. Champions 12 years ago, Leeds relegation completed a spectacular decline in fortunes. Sometimes if you have a look back in the season, you say we're unlucky here, unlucky there, but I think it ended up there when we've played like we have done. Um, we don't deserve to stay up. It's a sad day for the club. Um, and it's been a difficult year for the players and for the supporters and everybody connected with Leeds United. But I'm sure that we'll bounce back. Newcastle had to win their final two games of the season against Southampton and Liverpool to pip the Merseysiders for fourth spot. They fell at the first hurdle, drawing three all with the Saints at St Mary's. It's a financial blow, naturally. Um, it's also uh, a blow to our prestige, I guess, and our reputation. Headmaster's report would be disappointing. Should have done better. And so to the final day. Aston Villa new victory at home to Manchester United would guarantee them fifth spot and a UEFA Cup place. Cristiano Ronaldo put an end to their dreams. Over at Anfield, Newcastle drew with Liverpool to grab fifth. Fourth place for Liverpool, but they finished 30 points behind the champions and with uncertainty surrounding the club. A three-way power struggle for control was developing, involving chairman David Moores, local businessman Steve Morgan and the Thai Prime Minister. Houdier's job is far from safe. Portsmouth were the only promoted club to survive, but Harry Redknapp had a blazing public row with chairman Milan Mandaric ahead of their final. At Stamford Bridge, runners-up Chelsea ended with a win against relegated Leeds. An incredible season at the bridge, and a hugely popular Claudio Ranieri did a tearful arrivederci. It looks like Roman Abramovich will appoint a new man, but Ranieri doesn't really know. I tried to do all my best, and I think the job was done. Now, what happened, I don't know. I can only pass the ball to, to, to Roman. At Highbury, Leicester City stood in the way of Arsenal and football immortality. Arsenal looking to invent something again around the edge of the box. They've done just that. It's Vieira. Oh, it's a picture goal to put Arsenal in front. That's why they're the champions. The first side of the modern era to go through a season unbeaten. The champions are Arsenal. Arsenal finished 11 points clear of Chelsea and 15 ahead of Manchester United. Charlton, Bolton and Fulham all finished in their highest ever Premier League positions. Everton and Manchester City were the biggest underachievers of the season, both flirting with relegation until the final few weeks of the campaign. It was also a season to forget for Tottenham Hotspur in 14th and Blackburn 15th. In 1889, William Suddle led the old Invincibles of Preston North End to the first and only unbeaten season in English top-flight football history. 
In 2004, Arsene Wenger led the new Invincibles of Arsenal to one of the most remarkable feats the modern game has ever seen. The entire 20th century stands between the two sides, and comparisons are futile. What is evident to anyone who's had the pleasure of watching Arsenal this season is that they play the game with a grace and elan that can take the breath away. Their football is simple, the results are devastating. The question is, who can beat them next season? See you in August. Until then, from Ian Dark and me, Marcus Buckland, it's goodbye. <laughs>